The Law of Tithing. How is this to be understood in Messiah? Tithing today, are we supposed to do that in Messiah? Greetings, I'm David Brett, here with John Fisher, bringing you Revealing the Truth. We have to consider some of these things because we understand that in Messiah, some things have been adjusted. They've changed out of necessity uh, because we read that we're under a new order. No longer are we under the Levitical priesthood with sacrifices and purification rites and and ceremonial aspects, and even the civil law has changed. We don't go out stoning people, but we ultimately understand that those that are defiant against Yahweh will suffer a second death. So it's not that the law has really been done away with. I mean, we understand that uh, tithing is applicable for us. Many churches out there understand that tithing is applicable, and they'll, they'll justify it because, hey, uh, even Abraham, uh, tithed, and that was under Melchizedek order. Well, we can also recognize that um, these principles, uh, such as the Sabbath, is unchanging. It's part of the commandments of Yahweh that has been from the very beginning. In fact, if we look at the Sabbath in Exodus 16 and verse 28, Yahweh asks the question, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? Now, you have to understand why that came up. It came up because they were breaking the Sabbath, the seventh day. Now, wait a minute. They haven't even gotten to Mount Sinai for the law. You mean the law was in existence? Absolutely. When you go down to verse 34, it says, As Yahweh commanded Moses and Aaron, place it before the testimony to be kept. Of course, this was the jar of manna that was being spoken of uh, because they started to be fed this manna. And when we look at the word, we have to understand there's a literal aspect, figurative aspect. There are different aspects and things that we have to consider. Uh, the question's been asked about Revelation, for example. Do you have to take that literally or figuratively? <laughs> well, yes. Right. When it's literal, yes, take it literal. When it's figurative, yes, take it figuratively. But we understand that, uh, you know, the scholars even recognize the testimony at a minimum that is the Ten Commandments. So you can't justify not keeping the Sabbath because, oh, that was for Israel. Well, in our last episode, we understand that Yahweh is not done with Israel. That's the apple of his eye. He's going to bring Israel, uh, the remnant, brought into the kingdom, and he's going to keep his promises. Now, it's true that in Messiah, we have those promises and more. We have better promises. Uh, we're told in uh, the book of Hebrews. It even references uh, Jeremiah 31, and I, I think we can look at Ezekiel 36, 26, 27, uh, as starting in part with a, a new heart, in a sense, we're a new creation in Messiah. Uh, that stony heart has been taken away from us. Uh, we're still growing. The Messiah is growing within us. There, there are things we're still learning. But the prophecies were that we would be given a spirit so that we would be obedient mm -hmm. to his, his commandments, his ordinances, which are from the beginning. So it's not that, well, you know, later uh, after the beginning, uh, you know, Yahweh put a bunch of laws there and then took them away for us today. No, they, these principles like tithing, uh, the Sabbath, resting uh, the seventh day, that, that's, Yahweh did that. Mm -hmm. He set the example. Shouldn't we do that as well? So that's what we need to look at today mm -hmm. and consider tithing in Messiah. Right. We also need to take a look at the difference between Hebrew thinking and Greek and Roman thinking. Um, when we talk about the law, it's really a poor uh, translation of, of the word Torah as we find it in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Torah means teaching. It means 
It's, it's the instruction that a father gives his son about how to live life. And if we make it into a law, <laughs> like this, you just post it on the wall, you know, and you have to abide by that, that, that turns Yahweh into something that he is not. He's not just a judge. He's a father. And he's giving us, he's giving us his children, instruction on how to live our lives. If we get into this idea that we have to determine what does the law say, <laughs> then we, we will be arguing from here till the kingdom comes. Um, but the, the, we need to take a look at the, the scripture as a father's instruction rather than as a set of laws that are on you know, the civil code about, you know, you have to stop at a red light and go on the, it's not just that. Yeah. It's doing the things that are good for us. Right. Well, and Yahshua, uh, well, uh, in speaking of the civil co code, he said, well, you've heard it from old, mm -hmm. you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, essentially. Mm -hmm. But I say to you, turn the other cheek, you know. Uh, don't repay evil for evil, essentially, are in the sense of, you know, you don't have to do that exactly like that was. And of course, that was civil law for Israel. Mm -hmm. He is putting things at a higher level. We're to walk on a higher ground. Right. Uh, he starts listing the commandments, says, you know, not only are you not to do it, you're not to think about it, so on and so forth. And in the spirit, that, that spirit helps us to do that. Mm -hmm. And there's a struggle between the spirit and the flesh, of course, you know, uh, and we, we need to uh, be circumspect of that. But I think when, when we read areas of like Matthew uh, chapter 5, we have to consider there is that initial covenant. There is also the, the covenant or agreement in Messiah. It turns out when you, when you go through scripture, you're going to see both come into the kingdom. Well, how is that going to be? Well, we be changed and be spirit beings and be able to sit on Yahshua's Yosh throne and these type of things. Yes for those in Messiah. There are going to be those not in Messiah. They may have a belief, they may desire, but they may think, well, he's coming a first time. He hasn't come that first time yet, mm -hmm. so we're going to wait for him. Well, those people will certainly be brought in and they'll learn and they'll be instructed. But it's a physical and a spiritual people coming in, I think, as, as we understand talking it. about the Levitical priesthood versus the uh, uh, Melchizedek, Melchizedek priesthood. priesthood. Yeah, the, both are actually going to be active in the kingdom, it looks like, because when you look at Ezekiel chapter 40 and on, you see the Levitical priesthood in action, physical people, physical sacrifices, these things going on. In the kingdom. In the kingdom, and we know it's in the kingdom because Messiah is said to be there. But Messiah is with also a kingdom of priests that are different than the Levit Levitical priests. So it's interesting and you don't hear this in the mainstream churches today because they've come up with ideologies, teachings that are contrary to Yahweh's word. And we have to reject those um, on the side of Christianity and on the side of Judaism, reject those traditions like getting the details out of Torah through the Mishnah or other oral teachings. There might be some commentary there, but Yahshua was very angry with the Pharisees in the first century for having such laws and regulations that they had in place that trumped Yahweh's law. Mm -hmm. And their details were essentially abominations because they essentially did away with Yahweh's instructions. And when we go into uh, the Word, let me, let me uh, just go into Matthew 5, uh, 18 through 19. We're going to uh, go there. Let's go, let's go there first and see what it says. For truly I say to you, this is Joshua speaking, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law, until all is accomplished. Has all been accomplished? <laughs> not yet. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Of course, Joshua told the disciples, look, your, your righteousness is going to have to exceed that of the Pharisees. Well, but the Pharisees had the law. Well, they had the law and then they had their law. And uh, Joshua has been accused of breaking the law, but it was their law. 
And so Yahshua, we find, is perfect and a good example for us. Uh, but we find, I shouldn't say a great example, he's a perfect example mm -hmm. uh, for us. But we, we find him backing up uh, the law of tithing. Uh, Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. And so we find that things have been raised up and it's not necessarily a doing away from the, of the former. Now, when you understand that both the Levitical and the Melchizedek priesthood is going to be going into the kingdom, we can understand some of these words a little bit better. But in Messiah, and Hebrews uh, states it very plainly, there, out of necessity, is a change in the law for us in this new agreement. And as you've pointed out, Elder John, it's not new laws necessarily, it's, it's a new agreement. It's, we have to understand that these commandments uh, are essentially eternal. And when we consider uh, Psalm 119, 151 through 153, we can understand this. You are near, O Yahweh, and all your commandments are truth. Of old I have known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. How long is forever? <laughs> Well, we understand that these sayings are for us. Sabbath keeping, what did the Messiah do? As his custom was, he worshiped on the Sabbath. Now, it's true that the Pharisees added to the Sabbath, just as they were very particular about the Sabbath. They put a hedge around it and did things to try to prevent people from dishonoring the Sabbath. They also did the same thing with the name. But their, their hedge it essentially collapsed over mm -hmm. the very thing that they're trying to protect. And uh, we, we need to understand the, the history. But, um, you know, we find that uh, Abraham knew Yahweh's commandments, his statutes, his, his laws. Uh, before Mount Sinai, uh, you know, it's stuck in people's minds. Well, Mount Sinai, that was, that, that was the agreement that they obey those laws and then, and then you, now we're in a new agreement, so those laws are no longer done away with, are no longer valid for us. That's not true. The laws have been from the very beginning. Now, there is a law that was added, and that we don't do in Messiah, but that law is applicable in and for those under the previous agreement, covenant, that will be going into the kingdom who have not accepted the Messiah, obviously. Because if they had accepted the Messiah and they are in a new agreement with him, they wouldn't have to do this law that was added. Well, what is the law that was added? It was going back to Adam and Eve. We find that an animal had to die because of their sin. Very possible. In order to lamb. clothe them, in order to cover yeah. uh, their sin, basically. And when you look in Galatians, I mean, Yahshua is our covering. Let's close out here, and we'll come back, and we understand that uh, some of these things may be uh, somewhat confusing. We're going to help clarify some of these things when we come back so that you can understand as well. Did you know the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the original language? Yes, I did. What about the New Testament? Was it originally written in Greek or was it translated from Hebrew? And why were the revealed Hebrew names of Yahweh our Heavenly Father and Yahshua, His Son the Messiah, left out of the New Testament? Those are great questions. Learn the biblical truth. Request our free pamphlet, Was the New Testament Originally Greek? You can receive our free pamphlet by visiting us online at www.yaiy.org or by writing to YAIY 2963 County Road 233, Kingdom City, Missouri 65262 and call us toll free at 1-877-642-4101.
Understanding the laws of Yahweh were not just from Mount Sinai, but have an eternal place in and for the people of Yahweh and for those that will join uh, is that opens up the doors to a greater understanding. But there have been traditions, there have been on both sides of Christianity and Judaism. And once those in Christianity understand that they've been lied to, essentially, whether the ministers know that they're lying or not. I mean, Christmas has, and, and Easter, they have nothing to do with the Bible. And you can't take these pagan ways and, and adopt them and baptize them somehow and, and start using them for worship to Yahweh. Yahweh says that's an abomination if you try to do that. Um, Deuteronomy 12, verse 30, 31, 32. He doesn't want to be reminded of the pagan ways. He wants us to worship him the way he wants us to worship him, period. And so we need to humble ourselves, come before him, and say, we will do what you say to do. And that was what the people were saying, actually, after they were told, you know, this is really what I expect of you. And they said, we will do all that you've said to do. And Yahweh, in response, said, well, if only these people would have such a heart that would go well with them and their children after them, uh, for their, it's because it's for their good. It's for the, and that's the whole point. Genesis 18, verse 19. For I have chosen him, Abraham, speaking of a, a forefather, father of the faithful, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of Yahweh by doing righteousness and justice so that Yahweh may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And of course, what was spoken about him? His, his descendants would be as the stars of the heavens and of the sands of the sea. We're talking about spiritual people. We're talking about a physical people, both being brought into the coming kingdom. Genesis 26 is very interesting because, well, both 18 and, and 26, because it's still before Mount Sinai. But Genesis 26, speaking of Abraham, verses 4 through 5, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and will give your descendants all these lands by your descendants. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because <laughs> Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge and my commandments and my statutes and my laws. And what does Christianity teach? Well, they teach for the most part that Abraham was faithful. Yeah, faithful in what? Well, of course, faithful in uh, doing what Yahweh asked of him, commanded him. And this is evidence for the fact that these things were given to him. And he was to give them to his children and the children's children. And so that, why? So that Yahweh's ways would be accomplished and done. And Abraham knew about tithing. He also knew about the Sabbath. There's no question about uh, these type of things. But we find that we are to be an obedient people. And when you go into uh, back further to Genesis 14, 18 through 20, uh, we find there's a little skirmish. Uh, he went after Lot because he had been taken in war. Uh, after that, uh, Melchizedek, king of Salem, uh, brought out wine and uh, bread and wine. This is Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Now he was a priest of El Elyon, mighty one, uh, essentially. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be El Elyon, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. Uh, Abram later sta uh, says and states that Yahweh, uh, of course, is the Heavenly Father's name, besides the title El Elyon, meaning, you know, Most High, Mighty One. But the point is, he recognized, okay, here is someone representative of Yahweh, give tithe to him. Now, the argument comes up, and I'll just bring this up because we won't have enough time to go over all, all of it, but the, the argument comes up, well, Yahweh specifically said, well, the tithe to him was to go to the Levites because they don't have an inheritance and they should get all the tithe. No, the tithe that was coming in was of produce. It was of animals, these type of things. Uh, but the, it was an agricultural society, just as we were in this nation, an agricultural society. Back in the 1700s, it was 
of the population was agriculturally oriented. So we could have done that at that time, but today there's like you know less than 2%, around 2% that are in agriculture. So what do we do? Well, we give of our increase because Yahweh's principle of tithing still stands. And when we go into a deeper study, we understand that there are some changes and we find that uh, Yahweh uh, still requires uh, tithing because if you don't tithe, then it's like robbery. Is that a serious offense? Malachi 3, 8 through 10 says, Will a man rob Yahweh? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says Yahweh of hosts. If I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. This is one of the commandments that Yahweh actually says, look, test me in this one and see if I won't honor it. As we are to honor Yahweh. And we're to honor Yahweh with our wealth. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor Yahweh from your wealth and from the first fruits of all your crops and the barns uh, may be filled completely and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, are we wanting to fill our barns? Are we wanting to fill our wine vats? Well, there's symbolism in this and we understand for us today in the Melchizedek order, we have to understand this in a, a spiritual way. The, the food, well, in fact, Yahshua, told Peter, do you love me? They asked him that question. And Peter said, well, of course. Yeah. Well, Yahshua said, well, to feed my sheep. Okay, feed, feed his sheep with what? Uh, you know, store-bought food? No, the spiritual word. And it takes funds, of course, to, to operate. Uh, of course, here at this assembly, we have literature. Um, in fact, we should mention, we have a booklet called The Temple Tenth. And it is uh, an in-depth booklet, and it, it shows the application of tithing today. Also, never let it be said, you have robbed Yahweh. This is a mini-study, and shows the tithing principle for today. Re we have to remember, these are unending principles of Yahweh. As, and just like the seventh day, that is a physical day that we are required to come and worship Yahweh in a spiritual way. So we do physical things, learn of spir spiritual ways, and if we're tithing, Yahweh's going to open up the heavens for us, pour out a blessing. Now that blessing, is that going to be physical? Is he going to knock us in the head with gold bars <laughs> and silver, and we're going to be all wealthy, and you know, we preach prosperity? No. Well, we can preach prosperity, but it will be in the sense of learning Yahweh's ways mm -hmm. and having understanding. King David man after Yahweh's own heart, uh, said, look, I, you know, he said he knew more than his teachers because he kept Yahweh's commandments and statutes and teachings. So there's a benefit to gain understanding, to gain wisdom. And in Messiah, there's much wisdom to be gained. But we can't just neglect Yahweh's word. In fact, he says, live by, you know, you want to live, you want to eat bread, <laughs> live by the bread that, that, that proceeds out of Yahweh's mouth, the living bread. And, uh, you know, he says that in, uh, you know, Matthew 4, 4, and also Luke chapter 4 and verse 4. And that's going back, quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8. So we, we need to understand that uh, there is food. We have probably 80 many studies and about 15, 20 booklets that are available. But this is physical food in the sense, and yet it's spiritual food. But, you know, it's just like keeping the Sabbath. Yes, it's a physical day. We, we come before Yahweh, worship in spirit. But he says not to come before him empty-handed. And, and I think a lot of churches push this, um, emphasize it, because they recognize the good that can come from it. But all of Yahweh's instructions are good. But again, there are some things in the Levitical priesthood that we don't, in fact, the, the, there's no standing temple unless we think of the temple that is us today, the body of Messiah. And of course, Yahshua uh, said, look, you destroy this, this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. <laughs> <laughs> 
well, how can you do that? It's been standing here for, it took us 60 years to, to, you know, to build it. But these are some of the things we have to consider and uh, grow in understanding and knowledge of the Master and of his Father, because that's the one he obeyed. Mm -hmm. And yeah. has he not given everything that we have to us? So, I mean, how much do sure. we own in our lives? Well, nothing, essentially. Uh, everything belongs to Yahweh. So uh, it makes sense as a father to a son to, to expect the son to um, respect the father in a sense of, um, I don't want to say paying back in, in, a, in a physical way, but certainly we would honor our parents for what they have given to us. Um, so mm -hmm. it makes sense to me in, in a father-son or a parent-child relationship that we would honor our, our parents. Now, initially when the, the initial pouring out of the Spirit occurred, there was great joy. There was signs and wonders, really. I mean, with mm -hmm. the tongues of fire and the wind blowing. And, but you know, and the people were there in obedience to Yahweh. Um, it says the upper room. Well, there's an upper room. If you look at the temple uh, platform, as we understand, uh, it could very well be that. But the people came in for the purpose of being obedient to Yahweh. And Acts 5.32 says, <laughs> you, are, you are to be obedient before even receiving the Spirit. And that's something else that's not really taught in the, in the uh, churches today. Mm -hmm. But these principles are known. Uh, we have them laid out in, in Scripture for us, for our edification, instruction. Well, as 2 Timothy 3, 15, 16 talks about uh, Scripture, and that's the Scripture they had. Uh, you know, uh, the Old Testament, uh, what we would call the Old Testament, the Torah, the writings, prophets. That's what they had, and it was for edif edification, for training and righteousness, uh, for the man of, of Yahweh. So... But, uh, you know, the initial pouring out of spirit uh, occurred in Acts 4 and verse 32, 33. And the congregation of those who believed were one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own. But all things were common property to them, and with great power the apostles were given testimony to the resurrection of the master, Yahshua, and the abundant grace was upon them all. Uh, continuing in verses 34, 35, for there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each one as he had need. Now, does this mean that they didn't consider Yahweh's word? That No, there was a change in process, a change that had to occur out of necessity. And with this change, they came to understand that uh, things had uh, been anew for them, but it was still applicable that the law of tithing be done. To learn more, go ahead and contact us, and we'll help you.